uh, welcome everyone to the second session of uh, uh, Lastro uh, Cine Club that uh, my, my students here uh, have been running for uh, a couple of months now at the University of Porto. And uh, we, we have a very special guest today, uh, a former professor of mine at the University of Buffalo. I'm gonna just briefly introduce him, uh, Professor Kenneth Dauber. He's a, a full professor at the State University of New York at Buffalo. Uh, and he specializes in 19th century American literature and in the tradition of ordinary language theory, right? So some of his books include, or all of his, I mean, I'm, I'm just gonna go through all of your books. Uh, Rediscovering Hawthorne, uh, which came out from Princeton University Press in 1977, The Idea of Authorship in America, Poetics from Franklin to Melville, which came out from the University of Wisconsin Press in 1990. And you also have an edited collection called Ordinary Language Criticism, Literary Thinking after Cavell and after Wittgenstein, uh, which came out from, the, the, from Northwestern University Press in 2003. And finally, the most recent uh, book, uh, which I believe we all read, a little bit. We haven't read all of it, you know. But uh, we, we, you're you know, the only. You guys are the only ones. The only readers. So I know. I, yeah. <laughs> so so uh, uh, Professor Dauber's uh, most recent book is called "The Logic of Sentiment: Stowe, Hawthorne, and Melville," and it came out in 2019 from uh, Bloomsbury. So uh, welcome, uh, Ken. Uh, Ken Dauber, and uh, so I, I believe Ken will uh, talk to us about the movie and the short story it is based on. So um, just just, uh, just to recapitulate, we're gonna be talking about uh, Herman Melville's Billy Budd, right? A short story and the uh, movie, uh, the loose movie adaptation that uh, French director Claire Denis made uh, called uh, Beau Travail. Right, so th that's, you know, the, those are the two objects we're gonna be talking about. Then uh, Ken is gonna kick off the discussion and then we'll, uh, you know, follow up with some questions and we'll also uh, try to read questions uh, from the audience on, on Facebook. So welcome, Ken, pleasure to well, have thank you. Th thank you very much for this invitation. And again, for the for the introduction to Denis and to, to Beau Travail, for which I'm uh, really grateful and grateful as well for having the chance to review Billy Budd from, from from one of the one of the greats and, and one of my most, most you know, favorite uh, 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 writers, Melville, and thanks also for the chance to meet you guys. It's been uh, that's 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 very nice, and you know, we'll continue. Um, uh, I, I just I just want to make an excuse. I this there should probably be uh, remarks and a kind of a teaching of a class, but I found in sort of making up notes for for uh, what I wanted to talk about that it it turned into a writing. So I'm gonna I'm gonna be reading back for the for and I I I, I mean it's not exactly appropriate for this situation but but so excuse me for that and um, uh, you know we'll 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 talk more informally after that. Um, I, I want to begin with a little quotation uh, uh, from an essay by Ralph Waldo Emerson called uh, Experience. Um, Emerson, as some of you may know, was the, the sort of great American philosophical non-philosopher. I mean, we were talking before about that American tradition. Um, he's not exactly a philosopher. He's not exactly an, uh, 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 an essayist. It's, it's, it's hard to place him. But there's an essay from, from that philosophical non-philosopher uh, of the mid-19th century who sort of bestrode this uh, century in many ways. Um, uh, and and maybe this will initially at least seem to you uh, a little remote from the business of ha at hand of of comparing the two works that we've been talking about. Uh, experience was written oh, more than fifty years before Billy Budd was written, uh, maybe one hundred and fifty years before Beau Travail was produced. Um, but Emerson had a way of putting his finger on a certain general angst that I think is still with us. Um, it's, the, it's, it's, it's the angst of modernity, um, treated as such by Melville, and which becomes sort of naturalized, uh, at least as, as I think I see it in Denis. 
Um, uh, it's an angst that's no longer angst, um, something that I will, a little bit obscure now that, that, that I will explain in, in, what, go, in, in what follows. Uh, but, but let me say for now, it's an angst that becomes uh, just what for us as moderns there is. And so in a measure objectified uh, or, or better, uh, insofar as Bourgeois is a, like Billy Budd is a work of art, uh, a product not of objective nature, but of subjective humanity, it becomes a what is that is um, the next best thing to nature uh, aestheticized. So, so the, 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 I'm, I'm aware of the opaqueness of what I just said um, uh, that, I, that I, I hope uh, I will clarify in, in, in what's coming. Here's the quotation. It is a very unhappy, but it is very unhappy, but too late to be helped. The discovery we have made that we exist. That discovery is called the fall of man. Ever afterwards, we suspect our instruments. We have learned that we do not see directly, but immediately, and that we have no means of correcting these colored and distorting lenses, which we are, or of computing the amount of their errors. Perhaps these subject lenses have a creative power. Perhaps there are no objects. Once we lived in what we saw, now the rapaciousness of this new power, which threatens to absorb all things, engages us. Okay, uh, what does this have to do with Billy Budd and with Beau Travail? Um, for that matter, um, and, and I hope this is a question that you've been asking yourselves because it certainly was a question I asked myself when I was uh, watching Beau Travail. What does Beau Travail have to do really with Billy Budd? of which Beautreville is supposed to be a version. Yes, that was, I mean, in your minds. Um, Billy Budd, after all, it's set on a ship at the beginning of the 19th century in the midst of imperial warfare uh, between two colonial powers, the colonial power, reigning colonial powers at the time, the English and the French. Beautreville is set on land. It's happening now in the, in the now of the movie um, of, of our time. And we're plunged into a life of a post-colonialism. Djibouti is free. The French Foreign Legion seems to serve no purpose. Um, a a, a post-colonialism where imperial warfare is a, is a kind of relic. Um, the mutinies at Spithead and the Nor, uh, preventing the outbreak of which are such an important motivation uh, for keeping discipline uh, among Melville's sa uh, sailors. Um, are irrelevant to the soldiers of the Legion who seem to have no motivation um, and with a need for military discipline sort of collapses into itself, becomes its own reason uh, with no reason discernible. It's not to make them a better fighting force. It's just because if you're in the military, you, you need to have discipline. Even the homoerotic theme that weaves itself into both works is different. Billy, the, the handsome sailor, is a cynosher. Every, everybody looks at him. Uh, he's the real object of a desire um, that repressed as it might be, sort of seethes everywhere in that novel. Uh, in, in, in Melville, who's, who's uh, um, uh, about which much has been written about his own gay interests, um, uh, 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 certainly in Claggart, um, but Sertan, um, handsome as I suppose he is, like the handsome sailor, um, is handsome uh, in the way of all the soldiers. <laughs> all the soldiers are handsome. And such that the dominant view of his handsomeness doesn't come from other men, but from the female gaze, the female gaze of the director, or perhaps of the Djibouti women who note it and note even the homoerotic erotic rituals of the men. Uh, with a kind of curiosity, with some appreciation, um, rather than with desire. Um, and most of all, there's the, there's the difference of form, plot, right? the dramatic climax in Billy Budd, an accusation, a murder, a hanging, uh, is minimized in Beautreville, uh, where there's hardly any confrontation, uh, an attempted murder, presumably, but pretty indirect, which the victim, Sertan, in fact, might even escape. And especially where Melville talks and talks and talks 
Okay? Um, and a speech that's just laden with the talk of others, philosophers, historians, artists, uh, that's laden with references to everything and anything. Um, uh, a speech to whose syntax is so terribly convoluted and difficult to parse, as I'm sure you found. I mean, I found it difficult, and I'm a native, a native uh, English speaker, right? I mean, I, it, it's such a, it's, it's so difficult to, to work your way through the sentences. Uh, when Melville does that, Denis allows almost no talk from start to finish, uh, no talk that signifies anything. Um, Bautrevi has a minimalist screenplay, right? Uh, where nobody really says anything. Um, and when, if there are references, uh, say in the music from Benjamin Britten's uh, opera, also Billy Budd, uh, or to Melville's Billy Budd itself, th those references really are rewoven as parts of the movie and not really referred to at all. I mean, Melville is quite explicit in referring, right? That, 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 that reference is sort of incorporated just in the in the in the in the warp and, and roof of the of, of the movie. Um, it poses the question, should we even consider these two works together? I mean, so 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 Denis read Billy Budd, it was a kind of suggestion, but 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 what has it got to do with it? Um, well, I, I want to say yes, that we should consider these things together, but under Emerson's rubric, um, the rubric of a kind of distance an alienation, a silence, that's what I was referring to at the beginning, uh, ultimately, a uh, silence in Beau where where talk is largely absent, and in Billy Budd, in the very talk, that seems to me to be the subject of both. Let me quote it again. Um, it is very unhappy, but too late to be helped, the discovery we have made that we exist. That discovery is called the fall of man, Ever after, as we suspect our instruments, we have learned that we do not see directly, but immediately. But immediately. Is this not, isn't this, you know, what Melville is ultimately concerned with? The alienation from reality produced by the mediation of our consciousness, our talk and our explanations, and how suspect that mediation is. Um, look, look at how the narrator struggles to make sense of what of what he has no sense, of what has no sense, of which he can, of what he can't find any sense for, uh, 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 of what the instruments of his reason and even observation cannot come to terms with. Billy is the very innocent, whose innocence is his guilt. Right? Um, Claggart is subtleness, um, uh, but his very subtlety, his deviousness, his planning, his concealment, um, are like the subtlety of the serpent in the garden uh, that Melville cites, right? Uh, uh, that is the serpent who from the beginning of his creations is, is the, in the King James Version, most subtle of all beasts, right? It's the way the Bible put it. Uh, and so he's rather, th th that subtleness is rather the natural truth of a character who's very devious, therefore, is the givenness of what he is. And so in innocence as well, I mean, he is subtle. That's that's by by, by that's that's this natural innocent condition. Um, struck by an angel, and yet the angel must die, as Veer says. The law of kings by divine right, enjoining Billy's hanging, the mutiny, is yet not the law of the divine. <laughs> the law of the divine is not law of the divine, which enjoins his saving. Veer himself is a combination of a prudence um, and a determination. Um, that sit together very uncomfortably. Uh, he's a warrior, but a philosopher, a man of action, and a starry a speculator, starry veer. He believes conservatively in the usages of the military to which he's devoted, uh, and these usages would uh, warrant taking Billy the trial to the Admiralty. Um, yet he rashly rushes to convene a drumhead court in order to keep up a discipline that he fears the crew will see as lax if Billy isn't executed immediately. Melville throws the, the very causality of the events that he delineates into question. Claggart plots Billy's undoing with forethought, right? Um, but it's Billy's spontaneous action that does him in. Um, how to account for Billy's body, a uh, hanged body not twitching? For me, says the doctor, I do not with my present knowledge pretend to account for it at all. 
and even concerning the way the story is told, Melville says, here's the quotation, in this manner of writing, resolve as one may to keep to the main road, some bypaths have an enticement not readily to be withstood. The, the story can't ever quite reveal itself, even as it presents itself. Every attempt at revelation just points to concealments all the more. Characters contradict themselves. Paradoxes and emporias are just all over the place. Um, what does Veer say to Billy in their final interview? We're never told. Um, how are we to take Billy's goodbye rights of man, when, when he says, uh, is it acquiescence or, or is it an ironic sally? Um, Billy Budd, uh, you mentioned Ma uh, uh, teaching it. Uh, it in fact has become the go-to text in American law schools uh, to use in discussing the relationship between natural law and positive law. But even this relationship seems framed by Melville um, as an inadequate frame, uh, an enlistment under the rubric of justice, say, of actions, the, the concept of justice, uh, bracketing or sidelining psychology, desire, cultural politics as law in itself must, uh, in fact, does no, no justice to it all. Um, Speaking of Fear's facial structure, uh, facial gesture on seeing Claggart uh, when 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 Claggart approaches him to accuse Billy, uh, a peculiar expression is how Melville describes it. Melville explains here it is that it was not unlike that which uncontrollably will flit across the countenance of one at unawares encountering a person who, though known to him, indeed has hardly been long enough known for uh, known for thorough knowledge. Peculiar, indeed, right in their words. Not unlike, but not exactly alike either. <laughs> unlike and alike. The templates we have for understanding, right? The, the philosophical concepts, are the, the modes of cognition, the templates we have for understanding don't quite work. Yet how can we do without them if we're to understand something at all? Now, it, it would be good to see the end of the novel, as many have, in fact, uh, uh, certainly, you know, when it, when it first was published in the 1930s, uh, it would be good to see the end of the novel as a sort of tragic resolution, uh, as a coming into the fullness of knowledge where, where all these contradictory and ill-assorted, you know, ways of seeing and understanding dissolve into each other, where Billy and Veer are reconciled uh, nature and culture, positive law and natural law combined. Uh, Billy, Billy soars to the sky and his godless Captain Veer redeems Veer. But in fact, in the text, there's no, there's no redemption. Ironically, Billy is ironically reported to, by the journals at least as a mutineer and, and worse, beyond all irony, if we want to just dismiss that as being ironic, beyond irony, Veer dies from the muskets of the atheists right, of a ship named the Atheist, with no God to redeem him. Um, a, a, a kind of nothingness swallows the book up. Um, as I want to say, um, uh, death is the nothingness that swallows Melville himself up before he can finish writing, right? This is a posthumous work, right? He doesn't, doesn't publish it. Um, uh, um, uh, it had to be published, as you said, some 30 years after Melville died. And the text, as we have it, uh, ends with a poem. Um, like the poems Mova right after, Mel's novel's career ends uh, like 30 years before his life ends. Uh, and in, in, in between then, he writes poetry, volumes of it, right? Um, uh, and he's a bad poet, right? He's, he's not a poet. Um, um, uh, uh, most of it is, is not published um, uh, either, but, but, but he can't stop writing. Um, uh, and that the, the, the poem that ends it, um, like these poems that Melville wrote after his career ended, before some 30, 40 years before he died, um, um, unpublished, with no readership, poems written as if to himself, sort of brooding in what he says, not says uh, uh, on what says, not enough even to attempt to be communicated, right? Um, uh, is is what is what is what we have at the at the end of the book. Um, not even that is to say the redemption of a relation of author to reader. Okay, I can't redeem the problems in the book, but there is a kind of redemption in the connection that I as author make with you with a reader. Um, 
can't save this writing. He calls it coming bud because there is no such relationship. Um, uh, or again, to, 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 as Emerson put it at the end of that paragraph that I started with, never can love make consciousness and ascription equal in force. There will be the same gulf between every me and thee as between the original and the picture. All private sympathy is, pa is partial. Two human beings are like globes which touch only in a point. Um, I don't know if you noticed a little reference in Billy Budd uh, to one of Hawthorne's minor tales. Um, the, the reference is to the birthmark, uh, one of the short stories in a Hawthorne collection that Melville, in fact, reviewed when that collection first came out. Um, and it bears on, on Billy Budd because the female protagonist of that story, uh, a beautiful woman, um, like the handsome Billy, has a birth defect. Um, in her case, a birthmark that mars the purity of her beautiful alabaster skin. Um, Hawthorne and Melville, uh, and which is her undoing, too. Uh, Hawthorne and Melville um, uh, were, um, during the period of, May of Melville's great greatest productivity, uh, w when Melville was writing uh, Moby Dick and then Pierre, um, they, were, they were fast friends. Uh, their lives subsequently took them in different directions and to different places, um, and they had not seen each other in many years when they met again. Uh, Hawthorne at the time was an American consul at Liverpool, Liverpool, secure, financially secure in his first adequately paying job that he ever had. Um, and Melville was traveling the world uh, for his mental health. Um, during, during the days of what was apparently a dark depression that his wife and father-in-law feared would become a complete uh, uh, breakdown. Uh, they walked the shores uh, at Liverpool talking and Hawthorne reported this in his journal. This is, this is what Hawthorne said. Um, uh, and it wasn't meant for publication either. I think we can take it as what Hawthorne is really telling his own heart. Melville, as he always does, began to reason of providence and futurity and of everything that lies be human, beyond human ken, and informed me that he had pretty much made up his mind to be annihilated. But still, he does not seem to rest in that anticipation. <laughs> uh, uh, and I think will never rest until he has got hold of a definite belief. It is strange how he persists and has persisted ever since I knew him, and probably long before, in wandering to and fro among these deserts as dismal and monotonous as the sand hills amidst which we are sitting. He can neither believe nor be comfortable in his unbelief, and he is too honest and courageous not to try to do one or the other. If he were a religious man, he would be one of the most truly religious and reverential. He has a very high and noble nature and better worth immortality than most of us. This is, this is just vintage Hawthorne with it, with a sort of combination uh, and Hawthorne, Hawthorne's my main man. But this is what this is a, 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 a remark is it, it's vi it's vintage Hawthorne with a sort of combination of appreciation and sheer fatigue. Um, Melville's speculations are dismal and monotonous. They're the familiar speculations of adolescence, moving about fate and free will and everything that lies beyond, beyond human ken, in Hawthorne's word. Um, the thing, sort of things that a grown man ought to give up already, right? Um, Hawthorne wish, wishes Melville would just stop. Um, and yet, that, that Melville doesn't stop, and that he doesn't stop, Hawthorne also says, is the mark of his high and noble nature. Um, um, yes. And so Melville keeps writing a high and noble work, Billy Budd. But now in Billy Budd, I think he too seems to recognize how dismal and how unfruitful, how even fatiguing uh, such a work is. He has pretty much made up his mind to be annihilated, but he still does not seem to rest in that anticipation. Think of Veer and the Atheist um, uh, here. Melville can't stop writing this, right? But he has no longer any hope that that writing will achieve anything. It's not finished and it doesn't publish. Um, so what Billy Budd does achieve in its explanations that explain nothing, in its philosophizing that undermines philosophy, the very activity of philosophy, is a certain internal and distance 
that the writing uh, itself expresses. Uh, it, 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 Emerson's fall into self-consciousness, into a self that, speaking of the self, only alienates itself all the more. It's a self that can find no place, no relation between the self and the world, no union between the inside and the outside, an inside narrative, right? That's the subtitle of Billy Duckard. An inside narrative, as the subtitle puts, but written from the outside. Um, what it achieves, I think, is the expression of a non-belonging. Um, that's the subject, I think, of Claire Denis' Beautreville. Um, this is the point of the French legionnaires in Djibouti at the present time. Um, Gone now is the, the, the attractive romance of the thing, of the Legion. Uh, say as in, uh, have you all seen Beaugest? You know, ah, you must see, aha, you see, you study film, you study cinema or film and not the movies. You got to go see Beaugest, a great Hollywood production from the 1930s. It was a movie from the 1930s starring Gary Cooper. Do we know who Gary Cooper was anymore? Right? Okay. Uh, Bojas, the movie it, from the 30s starring Gary Cooper uh, at, that brought the romance of the Foreign Legion onto the big screen. Um, uh, only the point in Denis, this non-belonging, you know, Gary Cooper as outside the England he comes from, uh, non-belonging is now taken as the condition to which man now in fact belongs. We do not know why any of the particular legionnaires has signed up. They haven't signed up, as Gary Cooper has, right, uh, for love, love lost or duty to be done. Um, they weren't impressed into service as Billy was. Uh, the, the legion was famously voluntary, right? Uh, maybe you could say they're foundlings or kind of foundlings as Billy was, at least in the sense that they become disaffected from their families and friends. But there's never any hint about their former lives. They never discuss it. They never talk about it. There's, there's nothing given by Denis. Uh, even, if, even being a foundling is a kind of reason um, uh, uh, that Denis does not, doesn't supply. Um, not even international politics uh, motivates the Legion's activities, as we've said. Um, uh, the Legionnaires and the Legion just don't belong in Africa anymore, right? Um, uh, the Africans do. Um, uh, they are undivided from where they live. They are not modern uh, in Emerson's sense. Uh, in Denis' understandings, they have not fallen into self-consciousness. They are definitely selves, expressive, vibrant. They wear colorful clothing. They go about their activities of buying and selling and loving and dancing with, with real gusto. But the legionnaires do nothing, or, or they do the particular nothing of doing all of those things done by legionnaires with nothing to do. I mean, they iron their, they iron their clothing. I mean, what, what, do, what do they do? Um, uh, they are selves, we might say, who, who, as it were, have passed through the modernist fall into alienating self-consciousness and have emerged in the condition of the modernist now as unself-conscious again. But it's an unself-consciousness that almost negates the self rather than fulfills it. An unself-consciousness that is not a more vital life, but, but a residing in a pure alienation that might as well be death. Um, th th to speak in literary terms, the Africans, as Archibald MacLeish put it, do not mean but are. Speaking of poetry, a poem should not mean but be, MacLeish says. Yet the African's being is alive where the legionnaires are uh, just, because, just because they are, um, and such that being becomes non-being, vitality merges into pointlessness. Um, in Ludwig Wittgenstein's aphorism, explanations must stop somewhere, and well, the Africans know where to stop. Moderns don't, or at least can't stop. That is why Melville, who also can't stop, gives us so many explanations on top of explanations, all, get, all getting us nowhere. So in Denis, as a sort of next stage after Melville, explanations have also stopped, but they've stopped not in the somewhere of an African's or a Frenchman's or of anyone's life, what, what Wittgenstein called our ordinary life, but in that nowhere that explanations of themselves exiled us into.
that, that, that's what I meant at the beginning by calling Beautrevay a story of angst, in effect, without the angst. Um, talk, as we said, is minimal. Um, what we have is pictures instead, and pictures not of selves, but of selves become bodies, uh, a kind of landscape of bodies, beautiful, but without any expression of personal or cultural or political depth, which are also therefore arid, like the lush but arid pictures of the Djibouti landscape. The characters don't speak, but are shown as what, that's what McLeish would want. Um, um, here too in, in Denis is, is an inside narrative composed from the outside, uh, begun in fact in the diary of Galou, right? But which quickly moves away from the diarist to the point of view of the camera. Only in the camera's view, there hardly is any inside, which doesn't so much cease to exist, but, 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 but becomes one with the outside and all the alienation um, that that implies. In the end, Denis gives us no redemption, as Melville gives us no redemption. The Louvre is not rehabilitated, but cashiered, right? Um, nor does he repent or come to terms with himself of what, after all, is there to, to repent. His murder of Santan is not quite murder. He could easily have crossed the mountains into Ethiopia, he says. On the other hand, neither is Galoob given over to the atheist. God is just too absent not to be believed in, right? I mean, you have to have a God not to believe in him, right? Uh, and it's, it's just not even there. Um, the suggested suicide of Galoob, uh, suggested by the rifle he lays on his chest, before the closing scene, uh, after he's tidied up his room and finished writing his diary, may not, probably does not uh, happen either, um, uh, because he appears in that closing scene in a remarkable dance. Um, and here, I, I want to quote William Butler Yeats's, uh, Yeats's uh, famous poem, How Can We Know the Dancer from the Dance? Well, what Yeats was thinking of was something like the activity of the, of the Africans, their individual selves merged into the life of the world. Only what Denis, I think, was thinking of is a world where such merger is possible, not in life itself, but only in the modern, in the modern condition of life, in the made, in the artistic, in the, in the, not, in the not real. Um, it's possible only in the life stylized, choreographed as a dance, Right? Consolidating the, the choreographed training and activities of the lives of the legionnaires, which, which too seem more of a dance than a life, the aestheticization of a life, which we can only live in by looking at, right? um, as in the mirrored room in which Elu dances. Um, and what more would, be, would there be to explain what to show after that? Um, the rest is silence, right? In Shakespeare's words in, uh, in Hamlet. What more is there to say than silence itself? <laughs> okay, those are, those, are, those, are, those are my remarks and there was no way to put them together. And uh, I'm, I'm happy to explain further or answer questions or get instruction from you about um, what else uh, particular uh, Beautreau is about. Don't presume to tell me what Billy Butt is about. I'm going to claim, <laughs> but, but, but certainly the Butt or I. Okay, or even Billy Butt. No, th thanks so much, uh, Ken. Th that was really wonderful. I mean, I I'm sure we'll all have to like watch the video again to get the, like, the, the full extent of what you were trying to get at, like on multiple arguments that you, uh, you've woven together in your in your presentation. Um, I don't know if, uh, do you do you guys want to ask uh, Ken a question first or should I should I just go? Uh, go you ahead. go and then, uh -huh. yeah. then we intervene. No, I mean, I, I just wanted to to draw attention. I mean, this is sort of obvious, but to draw attention to the the uh, fact that in the movie, right? It's, it's, uh, it's Claggart that it sort of takes up the main the main role, right? Like the, the, as you, I mean, as you uh, said, Ken, Luke. right? Like there's no resolution that he does not seem to uh, achieve any sort of redemption or, or whatever, right? Like, but, um, but unlike, you know, in, in, unlike the short story, right? He does survive, right? 
he uh, with and and survived to think about what he did, etc. Right, and uh, but as you as you said, um, he does not you know move on, right? And that seems significant because let, let me just say this: that this this is I think a significant theme uh, in most of uh, uh, the Denis films that I've seen is that all of the characters that she uh, sort of uh, puts in, in the foreground have this unresolved uh, conflict that they always go back to. And that seems to be, I mean, even though I agree with you that of course, the, you know, the film is about meaninglessness, right? And is about the meaninglessness of the present. There does seem to be a struggle, right? They struggle between good and evil, let's put it that way, since that's the way, you know, Billy Bob, I think, frames it, right? Uh, um, there is still something that this guy is chasing after, right? He's, he, he cannot really resolve it, right? He's, he's sort of stuck in the past, right? And we're sort of living his memories, right? Or, you know, sort of um, the movie is about like a, a you know, um, his memories or whatever, right? It's, it's just, uh, um, anyway, I'm forgetting the, the fancy literary term for this, but, any, but in any case, you get what I'm saying, right? Yes. Uh, let, let, let. Go yeah, for yeah. it. Yeah, no, no response. I think this is right on. I, I, let me begin by just citing something at the at the end of Moby Dick. I, I don't know again if, if you know that novel, but but you know the contours of it, right? So Captain Ahab is after the great white whale, and he and he dies when well, the whole crew dies, but Ishmael remains at the end to tell the story. Otherwise, there would be no one. But at the very end, um, he, he uh, Ishmael is is rescued uh, by floating on a coffin, right? A coffin life that which becomes his his life point. Um, uh, and Melville remarks that the um, the savage seahawks don't attack him; the sharks don't bite him. Um, my sense is that what Melville is saying there is yes, he's alive. But he's as good as dead. I mean, that's that's why that's why that's why the, these animals don't kill him. He's dead already, even though, of course, he is alive. Um, and I and I and I I think this is something further. And I want to talk about this in, in Denis. And and I'm remiss in not you know I not not not, not knowing the, the rest of Denis. Um, um, I, I think you're right that the, these problems are these con conceptions um, the, the, at a conceptual level are never solved. And so there's a kind of problem. But I think the very point of what Denis is saying is that these conceptual problems, right, are not in fact real problems. Uh, I mean, they're, they're the problems given to us by the fact that we are conceptualizing beings, that we have fallen into self-consciousness. We don't simply live um, we are not only those people who live, but we are also those people who explain our lives, perhaps pre-modernity, although I don't know that that was true either. But at any rate, in this conception of modernity, perhaps pre-modernity, um, uh, we could be what we did. Um, um, uh, now we are what we do, but we're all also equally what we think we're about what we're doing. Um, and it's as we begin to think that what we're doing gets conceptualized and gives us all kinds of conceptual problems, which are a very function of our thinking. Uh, well, one solution is to stop thinking. That was Wittgenstein's solution, right? One of the one of the one of the things is in in something like the philosophical investigations. One of the things he's attacking is uh, philosophy. I mean, he's philosophizing against philosophy. Um, uh, uh, in fact, says at one point, um, he does philosophy to prevent him from, to, to, in order to enable himself to stop doing philosophy, right? To stop thinking already, right? Um, uh, uh, taking yourself away from your life. The difficulty is, what kind of a person would you be if you, I mean, would you even be yourself if you didn't think? Um, uh, would you be yourself if you didn't constantly interpret yourself to yourself? Um, uh, so you're constantly caught up in, in, in the, I mean, again, maybe in a pre-modern world, in the Africans, as, as Denis, it seems to me, is representing them, they just live, right? Um, uh, but for us to just live would not to be ourselves and, uh, ourselves at all. And I think, so that I think um, the, the, though indeed Galoub doesn't resolve anything, right? Uh, now Melville, or switch back to Mel Melville, still has to write about this. He still has to write about this silence. 
I think what's happening in Denis as a step further saying is that all of this thinking about and conceptualizing, um, that's just, that's, th those aren't, th th that isn't our life. That's just the way things are. They themselves, that itself resides into our, just our way of being. Um, and it offers us no way of explaining ourselves. It's just another mode of our non-explainable uh, uh, life. So I, I don't think the irresolution of, of, of anything means that there's still a struggle. I think it means that the struggle itself is taken as, oh, just a form of activity that can't be privileged as, define, as defining the book. Um, you know, defining the movie, or defining, our, defining, our, defining our lives. Fair enough. I'll, I'll, I'll go back to that later. Maybe, so I, I think Andre wanted to ask something uh, that I interrupted him, I think. Oh, uh, go, go ahead, John. You want to ask some, some more on that? No, one thing that I was thinking while, while you were talking, uh, Ken, was the, yeah, the, there is this, this thing where it's, it's all written. And as you said in your talk, there was this thing where the, 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 the film is very, but basically I think Galoop is the, is the main character because, for example, the character of Billy Budd, which I don't remember the name, he doesn't really have kind of a personality, you know, like it, it, it's, it's very dry. And there is this thing of, uh, where it's almost, there is not this overthinking or not. There is this, this physical aspect of the, of the movie, which is like uh, the dancing and, and, and all those things, which I don't know exactly how, uh, how it relates to this, uh, this idea of the, like the, the conceptual part of the. Uh, 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 uh. Um, well, if nature is just what is, if life is just what is, right, outside of conceptualization, right? Um, but yet we as people do think, do arrange, do cognize, but that cognition itself is not more of a life, but it's only part of the nature of things. The, the way of saying that is by being aesthetic, right? Uh, is, is, is the aesthetic itself. I mean, what, what is the aesthetic? Um, um, I mean, it's it's that which we create only to look at, right? That which that which is a thing that is seen and not talked about, so that the talking, the conceptions, um, all the problems that 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 art, that art raises or talks about become just part of a kind of form of something that is. Um, nature is not itself aesthetic, right? It's the it's the form we give to nature, um, uh, and yet that form is, as it were, naturalized as the naturalized being of human beings, it no longer becomes that life-giving force. I mean, we, we, I mean, we generally think that our thinking is going to tell us about the meaning of our lives, right? Uh, and it's as if we're saying in aesthetics, the, our thinking becomes not the meaning of our lives, but just the, themselves, the way in which our lives are looked at, right? Um, but in other terms, you know, when 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 people traditionally spoken about realism and say in the novel, right, uh, uh, it means describing things and activities. Well, and as opposed to let's say the kind of moralizing that goes on in uh, you know in uh, in in the in the in the in the high in the high Victorian novel, the kind of interest in what people are thinking uh, is not exactly realistic in the same way as as movement realism would become, which describes material objects. Um, I think that's a wrong way of looking at it. The realis realism, if it's about people, is going to include all of their thinking, but not their thinking as a key to who they are. They're thinking as just like their bodies, what is, right? Uh, and not the answer to what they are or not the solution to the problem of their life, just one more of the facts of, of a human person's life. Um, uh, so, 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 I mean, I think that's, I think that's what, 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 that's where the aesthetic fits in. That's where the dancing fits in. Um, uh, it's a turning of our of our thinking, of our conceptualizing, of our way of organizing the world into one more thing that just is right? uh, 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 the is of who we are, and not and not a and not a key to it or an answer to it or uh, a finding of a meaning. In it. That would be very different from from Plato or Aristotle's notion of the aesthetic. <laughs>
Thanks. Thanks a lot. Uh, as John said, I don't have to rewatch this. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I'm so glad. <laughs> uh, yeah. Hi. Sorry, sorry, John. You want to? to... Okay. And um, I also I I have written <laughs> a written text here. Ah, um, well, thank. I want to express my full gratitude to to you for accepting the invitation extended by João Guimarães to speak to us about your your expertise, of course, and mainly of Melville's Billy Bud. Uh, thank you for sharing both your profound knowledge and your your invaluable time. Actually, I had, I had teachers who had profound knowledge. That's another that's another part of the modern condition, right? Our knowledge isn't so profound anymore. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but for me, in, 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 during my path, I think it's it's it, it's different for me. I mean, where I am now, it it it, it is very important. Um, it's it's a kind of perception, maybe, <laughs> uh, but it's it's about also sharing time. Yeah, time is rushing for all of us. So thank you for that. Uh, thank you for accepting. Uh, well, that being said, indeed, um, maybe I'll talk more about Cladini. Uh, Cladini, a, a big a bringing in the colonial Africa, where she spent her formative years, uh, profoundly influenced her artistic sensibilities. She she has expressed a deep affinity for the untamed beauty of African landscapes, of course, leading us to think about problems regarding an observer of a different culture and the exoticism in the outlook present in these phenomena. But what I want to underline here is that her experience um, imbues her work with an essence of raw and inhospitable nature. In a similar way, Melville took the sea, sea uh, as a common sailor in the age of 20, I guess. Uh, so it's, imp it's important evidence to me uh, of how both their lives and their wanderings had a stronger impact in their respective works. Uh, I think Cled Cledini's uh, films and uh, cinema seems to be primarily recognized for her, her distinct style, longing for an almost supernatural intimacy expressed in its plans and editing. This style informs the explorations of themes such, of course, as desire, sexuality, and the identity, but also annihilation of the self and or of the other the non-self is like our immune system, our body cells. Uh, however, she has garnered considerable acclaim for her ability to craft an atmospheric and visually vigorous mise-en-scene. I feel like her shooting style takes us deep into the complex realm of human emotions and relationships through a mode of a distinct a distinctive mode of stor storytelling that creates an ambience that keeps us on the edge, uh, full of tension and unease because of her capacity to elaborate deconstructed narrative in contemporary cinema. Thinking, think about both uh, in the intense psychological tour de force uh, that prevails in, in the way she delves into the mysteries within human connections and, and the fear of shared intimacy. To me, it brings forth strong feelings like the fear of death, which is related to the sublime while an aesthetic category. category. And there is also desire, passion, violence, and even terror all towards the protagonists themselves and the others. So my question or comment, commentary relies on, on the treatment of these ambiguities found in both Melville's Bill Buds and Denise Botrave. 
uh, there is something fascinating about how they both navigate those gloomy, enigmatic spaces, I guess. I may be wrong, um, but what truly captivates me, me about Billy Budd is its exploration, of course, of the eternal struggle between good and evil uh, with moral implications. But I think the story beautifully contrasts the character of Billy Buddy and the antagonist. But as, like, as you said, there is no redemption. Well, is there a call uh, for like Emerson philosophy, such as individualism, self-reliance, nature and transcendence, non-conformist attitude, or intuition and their inner vision? Uh, in Botreve, um, there is a, a, a compass that, that is broken. Uh, and Claire Denis emphasizes the compass, the broken compass in the film. It's an object that is broken. Now the protagonist has to endure, endure his path without the object, but it's the object, the object doesn't exist at all. I mean, is it of internal, uh, 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 I'm talking about internal compass, the nature of the, our internal compass that guides us mm -hmm, mm -hmm. because he is, he's brought to life. He was almost dead. And by the nature and by another kind of uh, performing curative, and uh, medical um, tools, he was brought back, back to, to life in this journey. This dichotomy between light and dark, innocence and corruption maybe holds a, a significant place within the realm of Gothic literature. It's a recurring theme that delves into the depths of human nature, shining a spotlight on the mentioned battle between the forces of good and evil that has shaped our occidental societies. Moreover, as a student delving in, in beginning to delve in these themes, I, I find it intriguing to explore a potential implicit, uh, a potential implicit aesthetic connection between these two works. Firstly, we encounter the confining and oppressive environment of the ship in Billy Buds, which uh, with its strict hierarchy of course and order, this setting evokes the claustrophobic atmospheres commonly found in Gothic novels, where the sense of entrapment and confinement and confinement looms large. The ship itself becomes a symbolic representation of captivity captivity intensified by the presence of enigmatic and brooding elements. On the other hand, Claire Denis in her unique way delves into similarly intense explorations, albeit outside the traditional realm of Gothic literature. I guess she, uh, as a fan, sorry, <laughs> uh, masterfully unravels subtle, but yet powerful dynamics of raw emotions. That's why the nature is so important. It's like uh, there is no boundaries or the boundaries is the skin and the skin is so permeable. The way she shoots is so, it's almost a supernatural power like it's not about the supernatural, it's a, as a genre, but uh, as a, a, an effect and style. Uh, so I think her films, uh, other films, showcase vibrant body movements, captivating dance, choreography, mesmerizing rhythms, and fluidity. Through these elements, she taps into the hidden depths of our human nature because of the body technology. Uh, and the body wisdom, though these elements she taps into the hidden. 
I mean, as you may have noticed, I, I really appreciate her works and, and how her distinctive filmmaking style treats, treats the human body as a wellspring of kinetic value, capturing intricate, intricate power dynamics alongside the recurrent, recurrent, recurrent sorry, themes of sexuality and desire in these films, but it's always disperse, uh, dispersive. It's a desire that goes to, actually we don't know where it goes, where, where it comes from. Now shifting our focus to the interartistic approach between the novella and the film, I would like you maybe to consider all these intriguing connections, at least for me, uh, that may or may not arise from these relations. Of course, by considering both the novella and the film as separate yet interconnected artistic expressions, maybe we can we all can gain a richer apprehension of the themes, the characters, and the underlying complexities that exist within the tale of Billy Bud. Maybe the new clad any visions uh, vision has added a layer of sensibility in the form of aesthetic effects to the original narratives. I don't know, but this interplay between text and film, um, written words and Im image, moving image, as you said in the beginning, always presents us as an, as an unique opportunity to explore and appreciate the story from a different artistic approach. That's that's all I have to say. <laughs> okay. okay, no, no. I, I let, let, let let me say let me let me preface a response. I've written notes when you were talking. Uh, a couple of things. First, first, first. As you said, um, you're a student of Denis who admires her, and at this point, you talked about of your studies. Um, um, I, I'm reminded of a comment by Thoreau in, um, in Walden, uh, where he talks about wanting to look at life, understand what life is all about. And uh, he criticizes the religious establishment and those who oppose the religious establishment by saying he thinks uh, we should not too hastily before investigating life, conclude that the point of living is to glorify uh, uh, the world, uh, uh, glorify God in our looking at the world, nor too quickly to practice resignation. <laughs> right? um, what I stand accused of in your remark is too quickly practicing resignation. <laughs> um, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm speaking of your age and my age, <laughs> and and. Um, uh, and I, I, I hear I hear the objection, and I I, I note it as a as a as a question. Um, uh, let's say which will frame what 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 I what I want to say next in my response to you, um, because I don't disagree with anything you've said except for one thing, <laughs> and that can be summarized in there's a. There's a novel by uh, Lionel Trilling, who was a sort of very important literary critic in the, I mean, the Trilling in the in the fifties and even into the sixties uh, in the United States. Um, uh, uh, he wrote one novel uh, uh, called uh, what's it called? Uh, I forget. Um, uh, but anyway, he wrote one novel, uh, and in that novel, the the protagonist, the hero, is a classic liberal who has uh, the period being talked about, I guess it's the 40s or maybe the 50s, uh, who has a friend, a good friend, uh, who's a card carrying communist, right? Um, uh, with whom he disagrees about politics and the way that liberals did with, with uh, communism. Um, and he says about his friend, what he really objects to in his friend is not his ideas, which he thinks are quite plausible, even if he doesn't hold them, right? Um, uh, but his attitude towards his ideas. <laughs> he doesn't agree, disagree. It's not, it's not the guys, it's not the ideas, but it's his attitudes towards the ideas. And what I what I what I want to say is that the conflicts that you talk about 
right, that you've talked about, that you see Denis and Melville uh, in their different modes working with and talking about though, that liminal state, that, that place in between, uh, that, that, that conflict between individualism and collectivism, between the self and, and, and other self, between nature, between culture, all those things. Uh, I agree, absolutely, those are the conflicts that are being explored in these book books. But I think, this is, this is a agreement, that there is an attitude on the part of Melville and Denis towards those conflicts, which I think are different from the attitude that you find. And I think that the attitude is one that comes close to that, that, that is a certain recognition, a re resignation in Denis, and that is a kind of resignation in its own terms in, uh, 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 in Billy Bud. That is to say, yes, they both would like to get outside that Western. I, they, I, they, I think. I think. I mean, your contextualization is quite right. Um, uh, Denis is a foreigner living in a different world, um, seeing something really different from her Western modern France, and being enthralled by it, and being able to to and and making her question. Uh, everything she knows, right, and her way of knowing. Melville, too, was a world traveler, right? Uh, 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 he gets out of his narrow America and goes to sea, um, uh, uh, as he described it in Moby Dick. Um, uh, uh, he's depressed. He has nothing to do. He feels like committing suicide or, or murdering people. And so he goes to sea, right? Where in fact he does, he sees the world. His his earlier books are it, uh, it lands him in the South Pacific, where he sees the life of islanders um, and the life that the Christian missionaries, in particular, but also the British and the um, uh, French colonial powers, are trying to impose on those islanders. Uh, 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 he lives among cannibals, or what he thought were cannibals, right? And much prefers the cannibals to Christians. Um, um, uh, he finds them kinder, he finds them gentler, he finds them more interconnected um, uh, at all the kinds of ways that you're talking about. But finally, and this is the moment in his first novel, the, the Taipei, which was sort of the kind of um, uh, fictionalized account of the real life events, the Taipees want him to join them. They're, they're welcome, right? Uh, and they want to tattoo his face the way that he is tattooed. And he reacts in horror at the notion of his face being tattooed, of him losing himself, right? In this kind of collective. And much as he appreciates the collective, much as he appreciates over and, or over and above the, the individualist, ultimately imperial aims, uh, that he sees coming out of the Western society in which, 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 which he is living, he is not an islander. <laughs> he has fallen, in, in Amazonian terms, he has fallen into that self-consciousness, which has given himself as a, uh, given himself as a single and separate self with a complicated relationship to the, to the selves of others. Um, and to give over that self and to join the to join this other world, right, would be to give himself up, right? Would be to give himself up. And he can't have it both ways. He can't have his cake and eat it also, right? He can't do it. Um, what I think is happening in Moby Dick is precisely his sense that I want, but I can't have, I want, but I don't want. I want to, to lose this, 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 this state as opposed to the nature into which it might be dissolved. Um, uh, but how can I, as an I, as the only I I know, as the only I which is possible to know in the world which I come from, how can I do that, right? Um, um, uh, I can't, and moreover, my God, I've been talking about this ever since I started to write. It's so monotonous, right? Uh, I, I, it's so, uh, it's, but, 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 what else is there to write about, right? I mean, uh, uh, but that. 
I think even more in at least this movie of Denis. And that's why the conflicts are muffled compared to the way in which they were present. That's why even the sexuality is muffled. Even the, even the, the that's why I was saying that it, it's hard. We might suggest that there is a homosexual attraction, a homoerotic attraction of Gelu to, um, uh, uh, to Santan. But it's not really so clear as that. Um, maybe he's only worried about um, uh, Santan's uh, being now regarded highly by well, I forget the name of his of his uh, of his captain of of uh, the guy who's in charge of the uh, of the place. Maybe it's only a kind of of uh, who's first in the in the eyes of my of of of, of, my, of my commander. Um, uh, maybe it's because 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 Santan is breaking discipline. Uh, uh, maybe I I mean it, it's it seems to be muffled, right? Um, um, uh, that's what I meant by all of the bodies being. I mean I don't I don't know that Santan's body is more beautiful than anybody else's body, or or unlike the beauty of the other bodies. They're all beautiful bodies, right? They're all beautiful men in that way. That's what I meant by there being no. The, if there's desire there. Um, it's not represented as my desire for you, as the desire of one person for someone else. It's just a kind of general condition of intimacy and embrace as they as they, as they embrace themselves in in in, the, in their various training in their various training exercises. Um, I think, in effect, what she is saying is is those very kinds of conflicts aren't so conflictual at all. That, I mean, if they're conflicts, they're not conflicts which are productive insofar as they're, they're not conflicts in which the life of men lives. Um, they're just conflicts um, of whether to have, I mean, whether you're gonna choose, choose to drink coffee or tea, or that's just what people do. Um, uh, that, 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 that they are de-existentialized. Right, um, um, uh, that they're, they're removed from the area of the problems of life. They're not the problems of life. They're just, as in your word, dispersed, dispersed across living with no special status at all. Um, uh, that she is practicing, that is to say, at least again in this movie, a certain kind of recognition. Those Frenchmen will never be Africans, right? Um, uh, but they can't be Frenchmen anymore either, right? Because they've seen Africa, right? Uh, so what can they be? Well, nothing much, right? Um, uh, and, and, and to say, oh, no, I can be someone who is in conflict with my desires. I can be someone who is negotiating that difference. That doesn't change anything at all. To make of that, right, um, uh, 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 something at the level of the of, of, of existential being is to make too much of it. So 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 again, I agree with everything you've said, <laughs> uh, except the attitude of the writer, the 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 the, the director towards what it is that that, that she's seeing. Um, now. It is true, said, I don't know the rest of Denis, and it may be that that is a misreading of her of her of her oeuvre and of her project and the way this stands in that project. I'm 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 certainly willing to be instructed, and maybe you're instructing me. Yeah, she does a, a remake of um, Father and Daughter from Ozu, the Japanese director. Uh huh. Uh huh. Uh -huh. Okay. It's very interesting. Yeah. But it's very partic particular. It's different. That's okay. what you've been talking about. Uh, I recommend that. <laughs> it's okay. called Thank you. 35 doses of room. <laughs> the, the five? 35 doses of room? Room? How, how do I say room? Room? Like uh, the, the room. Room. Oh, room. Room. Uh -huh, uh -huh, uh -huh. 35 doses. First thing you got to do after we disconnect, Ken, right? Yes. <laughs> Okay. Thank you so much. Bring 35 yeah. doses of so much for your feedback. <laughs> Jasmine, do you want to ask a question now? Yes, um, I'm still taking in everything I heard. Thank you so much for your lecture. Um, and I was 
was really interested because I think it's very, a very different reading that I have from the, the movie, um, the film. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but I think it's really enriching. Like I need to rewatch having in mind everything you said, but because I thought about this question of image a lot, because of course they look at each other. I think the one of the main forces is um, Forestier watching the soldiers and watching spe uh, especially the well the beautiful soldier here. But uh, so mm -hmm. Santa. But I think and I think this is made clear somehow that he is different um, in the movie. And this there's a sense of heartbreak uh, from Galoop, as I think there's a heartbreak from, um, oh my God, I, I forgot the name of Galoop from Billy Bud, but <laughs> I think there's this sense of, uh, of a shattering wor word, uh, world from uh, this order, but mostly I think a shattering of self-image, I think, Actually, I feel that in the movie there's a there's a lack of self. There's a there's no not too much self, but there's a lack of self uh, because what the self can do and think about itself uh, in the legion in the context of a legion is very is very strict, and when desire and this uh, sense of betrayal uh, disturbs this order. I think Galoop is able to see himself reflected from the eyes of the, the Forestier and also Santin. And these, um, I think Santin is like Billy Bud. I'm trying to make sense of what I'm thinking, but I think Santin and Billy Bud are both this like white canvas that Galoop uh, sees himself, but maybe a mirror, then he sees himself, parts of himself that he is trying so hard or not trying, or maybe he's trying, or maybe he's just um, not allowed in those circumstances to see himself. And that's why I think it's so meaningful, those, all those, uh, the body, the, the beauty of the body, but also the interactions of the body um, in the movie, because I think it's maybe the only moments they are allowed to express or maybe even to think about all these things that are not um, allowed cognitively to be taught or to be expressed inside the, that, that context. And then when I see all the, well, his life is, is completely changed and when he is dancing on his and looking himself in the mirror i don't think i didn't think of it as a performance of life in you of life itself but actually actually him being able to to expand his knowledge or his, even his self, but his self-knowledge somehow to make himself, to look at himself in, in this way that is just, and, and I, well, interpret it, it's possible to interpret that as his last dance, his dance to death and all that, but uh, is I think is maybe a last moment that he's able to, actualize his, his self somehow in a different way um, and maybe he can't tolerate that and he dies uh, maybe he only can do that right before he dies because it's well it's a expansion of himself that can destroy him does that make any sense to yes yes and let me say that, that, that one of the things that i mean um, the snake in Denise Garden is not desire. The snake in Denise Garden is looking, is self-consciousness itself, right? 
Galoob is the one character and, uh, and he's pockmarked and he's not a handsome body in the same way um, that Billy is. Uh, Galoob is the one character who is aware, who looks, who sees, uh, who triangulates, who, who makes relationships. That is the snake, right? That is the snake itself, right? Uh, and yes, there may be an expansion at the in in that mirroring itself, but that expansion is just an expansion of the very problem itself, right? It's not. It's not. It's not that he sees now. It's not that he comes to see finally who he really is and can live that, or can't live with who he really is. Um, it's rather that coming to see itself at that meta level is who he is. Uh, and that is the problem from which there is no escape. Neither, and that's why I was suggesting that the suicide is or is not a suicide. And that's neither suicide. That can lead to neither suicide, I can't look at it, uh, nor living, I can look at it, but a suicide that's not a suicide, a living that's not a living, an ambiguous suicide, right? Um, uh, that that's what we are, that, 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 that that's what we, we're in. So again, I think, I mean, I, I, I'm not denying what you're saying. I think, I think what you're saying is right, but I think the attitude towards it, right, is, is, uh, 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 is, it, it, it is, is different. Um, does that, I mean, at least, you know, you know, relate our positions. Yes, yes. Uh, thank you so much for your answer. Um, I was thinking that the looking is not like revealing a self that exists, but making a self. Uh, he's not that before he has, he is able to triangulate and see something. He becomes something that he wasn't before. And also he becomes something once he's able to see himself. But now with everything you said, I think maybe it's really less, um, less of a redemption than I thought, maybe not a redemption at all. So yeah, thank you so much. But it's the same, but again, it's the same insight, right? Yeah, I mean, yeah, right? it is. It's, the same. It's, 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 it's a question of what that camera's attitude is, right? What, what mm -hmm. and I, uh, again, I admit I'm, I'm not a student of film and I don't know the name. And I may be wrong. <laughs> yes, uh, uh, can I add just uh, it, it's very interesting the final thing thing. Uh, just mean I agree with you because uh in the beginning of the film, as Cladeny provides a deconstructed deconstruct na narrative. Early in the film, alone in the cold light of uh, uh, of France, uh, he declares declares Galoup declares himself unfit for life, unfit for civilization life, and he starts writing, and he he's a writer actually. He deals with I don't know his spectrums, fan, phantasmatic projections. That's that's the image, maybe the gaze that you're talking about, like in a fantastic, fantasmatic way. Sorry, um, he proclaims that freedom perhaps begins with remorse, and if it's true, his encounter with uh, Santin, uh, so so the seeds of emancipation. Uh, albeit that might only bear fruit in the death. I mean, can I can I just add something? Uh, and, and and we guys and and we all of us can like maybe go back to this uh, final sequence because by by the way, Ken, I don't know if you're aware of this. This is also considered like one of the best uh, movie endings of all time, right? So people do talk about the scene a lot or, and 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 whatnot. And and it is interesting to contrast it to the the other kind of dancing that that happens throughout the movie, right? Because the you know throughout the film, uh, as as Isadora said, right, like you know 
it's all the dancing is all very sensual it's very choreographed i mean it, she hired an actual choreographer to i mean as i you may you may have read this like yeah. so but but i find a, a significant difference between the kind of like very ritualistic incantatory hypnotic kind of dancing that we you know very robotic right as as you are kind of suggesting ken that we we sort of never leave that sort of uh, cycle of you know uh, cynicism and meaninglessness and whatnot. The, the the final scene though, right, stands in contrast to I think the rest of the film, right, and that I I I think is very interesting in the way, uh, in, in in the sense that we can connect it, I think, right, or, or we might be able to connect it to the you know one of the final scenes in Billy Bud in which he blesses the captain right he blesses the you know and so there's this expression of like pure uh you know uh pure good or whatever right like pure love or, or and and you can maybe find a tr an, an element of that right in this final sequence right in which he I believe is capable or is able I'm sorry to forgive himself right for maybe the whatever you know, bad things he did in the past or whatever. So he, he maybe is able, I, I think I think as both Jasmine and Isadora were su sort of suggesting, I, I don't, I'm not sure, but I, but I think they were sort of suggesting that he has attained a, a, a greater degree of self-reflection and therefore is maybe more, you know, at, at peace with the way things are, right? The, the, the kind of compromise, uh, it's very, I, I find this, this, opening uh, uh these opening lines from the the Britain opera right the 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 breath was written by um, Ian Forster so it opens I believe uh with some something like this there's always some fault in the good some stammer in the divine speech right so this idea of a compromised uh also uh good right that we we you know our world may not be you know perfect but but it you know there's something that's maybe redeeming about it right or there's there's some good that we may be able to hold on to uh, and I, I think so I you know so I, I do think the film is less cynical than than it seems maybe um, and the fact also let me just uh, add this the fact that as I was saying at the beginning the fact that the knee kind of just leaves uh, the Billy Bob and the 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 Captain Ver figures sort of to the side, right? It just pushes it, pushes them to the side and and focuses on the bad guy, right? So this is the guy that I'm gonna, you know, foreground, right? The the you know the 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 you know person with compromised morality or with with the gray morals or whatever. But as you suggested, you know, probably the the only or as I think just uh, me suggested the only character that asks some some actual degree of uh, self uh, awareness or self reflection, right? Um, yeah, I, yeah. I'm sorry, I I, I sort of lost. No, my train of thought, I, yeah. I I think I think much does depend on how one reads that final that final scene that final uh, act. And let me say two things about that first. Going back to Billy Budd, and you made the analogy with God bless Captain Veer, where there is some sort of of, of uh, um, compromise, redemption, murder. Billy Bird doesn't end. God bless Captain Fear. <laughs> it's a moment. It's a moment. There's one, and I suppose uh, that now we might say, you know, Mel Melville also died <laughs> before he gave finished form to that book. To that book. Uh, how would he have ended? How you how how is the the, the text a dense, a dense scene probably right. well. Well, well yes I mean yes you could see that book ending with Captain with with good God bless Captain Peter right um, um, uh, uh, maybe Melville would have ended it with Captain Peter. I mean there are other things that he changed I mean the, the text that we now have uh, the, what we have is the first chapter was once considered a preface. Um, uh, it, 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 there, 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 are, there were editorial decisions made. I mean, I, I, I mean, at any rate, you know, uh, okay. Um, uh, as we have it, what I would say is that that moment of redemption 
that sort of tragic recognition, if you will, and tragic resolution is just one more of the way we Western folks deal with our difficulties, right? Uh, and it itself is not the solution to that difficulty, but one more uh, within the chain of the difficulties that we have uh, 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 conceptualized. Second of all, uh, Denise, I don't think Denise is being cynical. I think she's being realistic. Right? Um, um, uh, and that her realism is not the same as a cynicism. It's not a despair. Uh, it's not quite a celebration. It is and is what is. It is. That's what I meant by. That's what I meant by angst. That's not angst. It is and is that is right. Um, so yes, you can say what you've said about the kind of self recognition coming to terms with himself uh, of the only character who uh, is at all capable of thinking about himself that we that we have in this book, or you can say yeah. But it takes place not, it's a dance that's not like the dance of the Africans where they're all dancing with each other, right? Or even the dance where the, the, the soldiers are dancing with African women, right? Where we have these kind, this kind of communal dance. But it's a dance all alone in a mirror room in a kind of narcissistic um, uh, uh, environment. Well, how do we, I mean, that, that would be the alternative, but, but, but maybe not, but maybe not as, as, uh, as, uh, as I've said. And I think that would be the crux of how one reads that and relates it, relates it to, to, to everything else. Um, uh, uh, and so, so it's a good question. I, I suppose this is going to have to deal with, you know, the sensibility that one has in, uh, in seeing the film. Uh, about which reasonable people might disagree, <laughs> uh, uh, and I and I hear what what you all have been saying. Um, uh, um, okay, maybe, you know, puts a question mark there that that I will I will think about too. Ken, do we, do we have uh, time for a, a second round of questions from from uh, the kids? Yeah, or? Sure, sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm okay. So, Andre, do you want to go? No, I just wanna. I just wanna. There are some things about the uh, the last scene. We could stay on the last scene, which is it's really good. But there, uh, there is this thing which which it it seems almost imaginary, right? Which we were saying because it is like, uh, and I think it is the same. Uh, I don't know the same place where the 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 dancing and the other. It would seem, yeah. Yes, but uh, he's in 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 France now, right? So it's it makes no sense. And also uh, uh, this idea of being in a sort of liberation of his, which uh, I, I don't know. It's uh, I think it's the part more enigmatic, let's say, which kind of uh, gets into the, the thing of the Billy Bud where nothing solves itself. Because uh, João was talking about the, the liberation of his, but his, uh, the face of the actor, Denis Lavin, is extremely deadpan. You know, he's very serious looking in that scene, which... You know, it, it it doesn't really solve anything. And that, that music, what what is the song? I don't remember now. It's sort of the rhythm it's of the, the night. It's the song. Yes, right? it's like, it's it's, like, like a, it's like a, a perfect mixture. So it it, it really doesn't uh, it doesn't answer anything. You no, know? like, but it uh, I don't know. Okay. Okay. okay, 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 right. The song is called The Rhythm of the Night, maybe. Yes. Which which is very interesting, at least for me. Do you know was it was it composed for the for the movie or was it a song that was No, in... no. It's a it's a song from from the 70s, the 80s, oh, I don't the, know. the Bee Gees or somebody, something like that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's very kitsch. Very, very kitsch. I'm very sorry. Kitsch. Very kitsch. Very kitsch. Yeah, very very kitsch. But the rhythm of the night is a very it's a it's a it's an interesting clue. yeah 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 oh I I haven't thought about it before. Do you wanna Isadora? Do you wanna uh, like ask another question? No. No, I'm no. good. Thank good you. Enough. All right, just being. Um. Yeah, it's just something I was thinking about. I don't know if I. 
have a question in this, but maybe if you want to comment about it. Um, there's this, well, all those biblical themes and in, in the film also the savior, the Santan is um, rescued by a kind of Mary um, who <laughs> hides him in her in the van and, and gives water to him and it's implied that he will survive. Um, and I don't know if you, uh, if you could comment about this idea of this, I think it's somehow more, also more positive than in Billy Bud, but uh, if, I don't know if you could talk about it in the context of what you've been saying to us. Um, it would be really interesting. Now, Hawthorne says about Melville that he can neither believe nor be unbelieve nor unbelieve. Um, and he would, uh, uh, if he could believe, he would be, you know, the most religious of men, but he's sort of the most religious of non believing men. Um, um, what the Bible means to Melville is, I think, a kind of, of source, a Western source of our understanding of things that he uses as he would use other philosophers, only you know, with a with a pride of place because of its of its of its cultural of, of its of its cultural place. Um, there's something on the one hand to talk about the ambiguity that, that you just talked about, uh, Andre. Um, both wonderful in this Western, in an attempt to, to use the lens of sort of Western formulations, um, the Mary that you speak of, in appreciating the kindness of the African, and something at the same time not quite right about it, <laughs> right? Uh, um, that this African kindness, the kindness, of, the simple kindness of a woman, right, um, uh, towards a guy who's dying um, um, uh, or would die, um, so that she is a Mary figure in Western terms, that at the same time, one probably shouldn't call Mary, even though how could we not if we're, if we're biblically trained enough, right? Um, uh, uh, how, how, how could we not? Right, uh, and yet how could we, <laughs> right? Um, um, uh, so, so maybe that's another way of not so much making it ambiguous as um, saying that the very terms that we have for speech, right, are themselves not solutions to anything. I mean, I, to take it to the metal level again, uh, but, but modes of approach we can't very well do without, but that finally just returned us to where we are. Thank you. Um, yeah, we can maybe, we can maybe uh, call it a day. I'll, I'll just, uh, uh, you know, add, add something I really wanted to say, because I was watching, I mean, I was trying to watch as many as, as you know, the kids know, I was trying to watch as many of the the Denis films that I hadn't seen, um, so that I could you know be more informed about like how to comment on on this one. Um, and one of the films I I watched today actually was hit uh, her first uh, called uh, Chocolate, right or Chocolat, right? Which apparently in, that was a famous French, one, right? Yeah. So apparently in French it means uh, to be betrayed or to betray someone, right? So there is all, also in that in that film that element of uh, you know be, a betrayal of the decolonized people, right? But it's it, there's a very interesting scene right at the end um, in which uh, there's an Af so it's it's an African American that's driving the protagonist, uh, who, so so it's a French woman. Who is like the the movie is about her memories about uh, you know living in Africa. It's sort of autobiographical, as Isadora was saying, right? But the the movie closes with uh, an African American living in the Cameroon, right, and saying, "Look, I came here 
you know, in, in, in search of a community, right? I was, you know, came here because I thought I would find like my my people or whatever. This is an African American, not an African. Yeah, an African American. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, um, and and he and he says, yeah, but they really like they don't they don't care about me, right? Like they don't care that they don't care about the fact that I'm black, right? It doesn't mean anything to them. I'm I'm still a foreigner, right? Uh, and I think so. I and I think this is um, something you find in you know every uh, film of hers that I've seen. Uh, until now, right? I haven't seen the one Isadora mentioned that that is a remake of Ozu. But it seems that the characters, sure, they're alienated, right? And sure, the movies are about alienation, right? But it's all of the characters sort of seek their own alienation, right? They're sort of drawn to uh, these exotic locales, right? Even when, they, when it's not Africa, because a lot of her films are not set in Africa, right? They're set in like remote locations that, um, the French uh, also colonized. I believe uh, The Intruder is one of them, right? Uh, but uh, the, her, one of her most recent films is set in Latin America, right? So it, it has nothing to do with, you know, the, the French colonial past, right? It's just as I was uh, telling Isadora last night that we were, you know, chatting about this. And I was saying that, you know, she seems drawn, right? Sort of as you were saying, Melville in, in Taipei and, you know, his, his first uh, books drawn to the exotic, right? And, and you know, these characters go out of their, you know, uh, place of birth or whatever, go out of, you know, the familiar or, you know, and they, they seek, uh, you know, to be an other, right? So it's sort of, um, as you said, sure, it's, it's sort of a predicament of the, you know, the contemporary condition or the modern condition, but, but it's also, all of these films are sort of uh, all uh, quest uh, driven, right? They, 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 sure, they, they have this like um, meaninglessness in the background, but at least these quests are meaningful to the characters, right? So they seem to be, you know, in any case, uh, in pursuit of something, right? To hold on to some sort of meaning, and it seems, and in most of the cases, it, it it's something either from their past, right, from their personal life, right, which maybe relates to, um, you know, a theme that you explore in your book, right, the, the logic of sentiment, right, it, in which you, I think the bold claim that you end up making, I mean, bold, you know, I'm not trying to be, the, the claim you end up making is that, you know, if there is something redeeming uh, about love, or, or if there is some form of love that we can build upon, it's going to be individual, uh, you know, uh, a love that comes from the individual towards the, the other, right? And not this, you know, communitary, uh, you know, as you, as you put it, uh, there's a very nice quote that I maybe can read, if you don't mind. Uh, uh, you say, <laughs> so you, you say, let's see here. Oh my God. Ah. So you you say at some point you're talking you're talking about uh, Melville in relation to Hawthorne, right? In the chapter uh, about Pierre, right? And you say, as we might put it, and this is the thesis of this chapter: Melville knows what Hawthorne knows—the lie of sentimentality that because God loves you, as Stowe has it, you will love each other, or in secular terms, that the other that the other may be conceived as the self the subject as an object, that all selves are the same self, converging toward the average Adam Smithian self. In sum, that love inheres in the economy of things and that the economy of things is what holds us together. Melville knows that there is quite simply no economy of love at all, right? And that as Hawthorne knows, it is the subject alone who loves and nothing holds us together but the subject who does, if he does, love, right? So, yeah, I don't know. Seems very, very, uh, very much in line with what the knee yes, is, yes. is going for uh, in her, you know. Thank you. <laughs> right uh, on. You do not you don't object, you don't object okay. to Talking about biblical metaphors, the it is self-exile or the exile in, in, in biblical terms. It's always a 
it can be, of course, a punishment from God, but it's also a form of deprivation from God. It's a form of separation. So when the, the Galup in the final scene of Cladini, he he's in self exile. Oh, of course, he was exiled because of what he did, but he is also isolated in self exile. So he needs this detachment from God, from, from the paradise of from the state of innocence to constitute a new form of psyche or or self or because death can be uh, of the flesh and also can be of a, another psychic death mm -hmm. and alterations of consciousness so uh, maybe you could say something about exile in in, in the bible <laughs> Professor Dauber, I don't know if you have. Well, I, you know, I, I don't know if this relates to, but there's a there's a it's a remarkable it's a remarkable concept in Deuteronomy um, uh, called the hiding uh, 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 the hiding of the face. Uh, that if you persist in Moses tells the children of Israel, if you persist in your bad behavior. Uh, God will hide his face from you and you will call out to him in distress and he will not respond. What that really is about is what in effect it is he is saying, and it, back it up with the prophets, um, the punishment for not believing in God is that you will have no God to believe it, right? I mean, the, 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 you, 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 um, uh, it's, it's over, it's over in Amos, where Amos tells the children of Israel, God will, you, you do not keep the Sabbath and you do not keep the first of the, the, the new moon. God will exile you to a place where there are no Sabbaths and there are no moons. The punishment for not keeping the Sabbath is that you will have no Sabbath to keep. Um, I, th I think that's right. I think that what you're saying is fundamentally right about the Bible sense of exile. Yeah, okay, it's punished. Yeah, okay, there's a punishment for it. Yeah, I mean, Philip is cashiered for what he's done. But the punishment really is that which you have with, you have withdrawn yourself from something, right? Um, and therefore, you, you can't just get it back by, by saying, okay, now I'll believe in it, or now I'll commit myself to it. You, 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 it's, it it's, 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 really, it's, it's, it's really not there. One might say that the, the, the dilemma of, of man when, uh, when he falls into self-consciousness after he eats of the fruit of the tree of knowledge, I mean, right, I mean, man's innocence is that that he does not know good from bad. He does has no he has no knowledge. He doesn't have the the, the knowledge the knowledge of evil. Suddenly, he comes into a kind of consciousness. He recognizes that he is uh, that he is naked. He sees himself, um, and that is his exile. And the worst of it is right. Um, when he is in fact exiled, you know, permanently, an angel with a flaming sword is placed at the, at the garden and tells him, you can never go back, right? You can never, it will not do to try to go back. You cannot go back. I mean, you know, once you know something, now you might say that part of the history of philosophy or part of the history of Western man is to attempt to go back. Right, I mean, Christianity attempts to do that, right, in some way with the advent, and, and in so wasn't successful because we're still waiting for a second coming. Right, the first coming came and it won't do. He's got to come again. Right, we're still we're still waiting. Um, there's a certain sense, it, 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 and I and I guess what I'm sort of saying about Malwood and Denis is there is an acceptance that you can't go back. Right. And that acceptance is not an acceptance in cynicism. And it's not an acceptance in joy. It's an acceptance of the real of things, right? That 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 that, that just is the real. One cannot go back. Um, in in the terms of the knee, you can't become an African as she conceives of the Africans, right? Uh, 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 you can't dance and play, oh, and maybe in a moment, but you can't live a life of, 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 of being at one with your life. Um, 
it, it, it lost it. It's gone, right? Um, um, uh, uh, in Mel's case, maybe you could become an African, but he couldn't do it, right? He couldn't become a South, a South Pacific Island. And I, you know, most of us can't. I mean, there are cases, I suppose, um, but, 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 but it's, it's hardly an aspiration plausible for the West, Western culture uh, 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 as, as a whole. Um, so that's, that's the way in which it, it you know, seems to be related. So, yeah, thank you. Thank you so much. Um, Ken, and, and uh, we'll let you go watch uh, uh, the, watch more the next movie. I will you know. do that. I will, instead, of, instead of working, <laughs> working I'm going to have to do it. Again, thank you very much for this chance to, to watch the movie, and most especially to talk to you. I mean, uh, uh, this is a better conversation I've had with graduate students than I've had in a very long time. <laughs> you mean, no, that's the truth. Uh, 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 I mean, this this was illuminating for me, and I will think to be thinking about what it is that you said. All right, so so thank you very much. It's it's really been a pleasure. Thank you, Ken. Thank you. Thank you. Soon. Same for me. Bye. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye bye. Bye bye.